Why don't you turn with me to Romans chapter four? And we we kicked off a series of messages uh, really last week uh, that will lead us up to Easter. We're going to talk about the grace of Jesus. Um, where we're going to talk about the goodness of God, and we called it nothing else, nothing else. And ultimately, here was here was my burden that I had um, when we started this series is that just coming back to this idea that we are saved by grace and nothing else. It is, it is the goodness of Jesus and nothing else, that, that it is because of God um, and everything that he did. So it is Jesus plus nothing. And I think sometimes when you walk with God a long time, sometimes we tie our performance to uh, our position with God. And we sometimes, if we're not careful, I mean, we can read about this in the New Testament with the, with the Galatians. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll start thinking um, that it's Jesus plus my good works or Jesus plus something that we do. And I even talked about last week how even the faith, because we are saved by grace through faith, but even our faith is a gift from God. To each is given a measure of of faith. In fact, Paul would tell the Galatians in chapter two, uh, verse 20, he said that the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the son of God. In other words, he's saying the faith of Jesus is actually in me. And so um, because of that, 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 that it is really by God, it is God and nothing else. Jesus plus nothing. And, and I just think there is such a power in that when we come to rest on the fact that it is because of Jesus alone, not because of us, but because of him. And not only is there a power, but there's a peace. Not only is there a power, but there's a peace. Everything God does, here's the power. Everything that God does is by grace. But here's the peace. Everything that God does is by Jesus' performance and not mine. And so there is a power and a peace. So we're in Romans chapter four. Paul, uh, he's writing this about 20 years after being saved. This is at the end of his third missionary journey. Um, he has heard about the, the church in Rome. He desires to go to Rome. And so he is writing them. And some of the best, I think, it, because of that, it, it, Paul is writing from a very mature place because this is 20 years post-salvation. And it is some of the best writing on the grace of God, Romans and Galatians, but Romans in particular, chapters three, through nine, some of the best revelation on the goodness of God and the grace of God that you can find. And so Romans four, verse one, it says this, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? And, and I went ESV, which kind of sounds like New King James on this one, but it says, what, what, is, what shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? In other words, did Abraham gain something by the flesh? Did Abraham gain something by the flesh? Um, for if Abraham was justified by works, so time out, what does that mean? That means if Abraham was made right with God by the things that he did. So he's saying, if Abraham was made right with God because of what he did, then this is what it says, then he has something to boast about. And then Paul says this, but not before God. In other words, no, no, he can't boast about anything. For what does the scripture say? So now he's pointing us back to Genesis. Abraham believed God and it was counted. Some versions say accounted to him as righteousness. He believed God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. Now for the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David, so this is David from the Psalms, and I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but the Psalms are actually very prophetic. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God accounts or counts righteousness apart from works. And this is the quote from the Psalms. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count or account. Same, same word, logizema, um, his sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not account his sin. It says, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I called this message bragging rights, bragging rights. Will you, will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much. God, we do. We thank you for technology. God, I thank you for every person in this room. And I thank you for every person watching in whatever room they're in. Um, God, we thank you 
ultimately for your word. And we thank you for the grace of Jesus, for your grace. Um, God, we ask in this moment that you would meet with us wherever and everywhere. God, that you, your presence, we talked about, is here, there, and everywhere. And so, God, we know you can meet with us. And so we pray you would meet with every person, every family, every person watching. And God, ultimately, we pray that the Holy Spirit would speak words of life, words of truth, words of peace, words of comfort. God, that you would speak to our hearts and transform us today by your power and presence. God, so that we could never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bragging rights. So um, back in the day when I could, I played basketball. And um, when I couldn't play, I guess, in school anymore, we, we played in a lot of pickup leagues, intramurals, those type of things. Played in city leagues. And in those leagues, you don't actually win anything. <laughs> um, you, you, get, you get to win bragging rights. Um, and bragging rights just means because I won and I beat you fair and square, um, I get to boast about it or brag about it until you beat me. So I have bragging rights because I accomplished something, because I did something. And so in this passage, um, what Paul is saying is that Abraham does not have bragging rights, that he didn't actually do what we're talking about, that he didn't actually find his way to God, that he didn't actually, in fact, he didn't find God at all. If you think about it, God found it. God came to him uh, in Genesis 12. And so he's saying, hey, the, the, the right to brag does not belong to Abraham. The right to brag belongs to God. And, and really what we're talking about that was accomplished by God is that God made Abraham righteous. I want you to think about that. God made Abraham right with him. Abraham didn't find it. God came to him. Abraham didn't accomplish it. God did it. God made Abraham right with him. And that's really what we want to talk about. I want to answer some questions. So how, do, how, do we, how are we made right with God? And then basically, how do we stay right with God? I really, I really felt like that's what I wanted to cover today. And so if you're taking notes, um, then you can write these down. And if you're home, you can still take notes. I know you don't have a worship guide or something like that, but you can grab some paper, a pen, whatever the case would be. Write this down. It'd probably be worth it. But the first thing is this, is we can be righteous because of Jesus. So Jesus has the bragging rights. Spoiler alert. If you didn't know that, um, Jesus has the bragging rights. We can be righteous because of Jesus. Verse uh, chapter four says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. The bragging rights belong to God. It's because of what Jesus did. And, and ultimately, I think what you need to understand is that the Bible talks about um, two kinds of righteousness. Ultimately, the Bible talks about two kinds of righteousness. So there is our righteousness. So let's talk about that. So when we're talking about our righteousness, we're talking about the things that we do, the things that we can do. So the, we could say it this way, the right things that we do, the good things that we do. Um, in other words, our works. Right. And so righteous deeds might might be um, uh, it might be helping someone in need. It could be uh, buying food for someone. It, it could be serving at an, an organization, it could be serving at your church. Um, there's a lot of righteous thing. I think, think in, here, here's the thing. You don't even have to know God to do a righteous thing. You don't have to know God to do a good thing. And so when we're talking about our righteousness. We're talking about the good things that we do. Um, but, but here's the problem. I think some people think that we are made right with God by the things that we do. And some people would even say the way that you get to heaven is by doing more good things than bad things, that we can do right things and we can do things that are not right, righteous and unrighteous things, right? Um, you know, maybe maybe you go out of town and you, you're on a sales call and you have a good day and maybe you're a, an unbeliever. You don't know God at all, uh, but you close the deal. You're excited. So you come out of that meeting and, and, and then you see a little old lady crossing the street and you're like, you go and help her. And then you see a homeless man and you give him some money and then you're walking by and some kids are playing. They're about to run out in the street you, you know, are their balls about to go out in the street and you grab their ball so that they don't run out in the street, you know, um, and you may not be right with God, but you do righteous things, right? 
Um, so righteous things are, are the things that we do. Um, but here's the problem. If we start th looking at our righteousness and, and if we think that the reason that we're saved is because we did more good things than bad things, here's what we're missing. God's standard isn't good. God's standard is perfect. Uh, James said it, that if we, if we struggle or if we stumble at one point of the law, in other words, we just break one commandment, one part of the law, then we are guilty of breaking the entire law. And so God doesn't have a good standard. He has a perfect standard. Um, that, that's, that's good and bad, right? It, it's, it's, it's bad because we can't get there, right? It's bad because if he has a perfect standard, none of us are perfect, right? We have all fallen short of God's standard, Paul would say. But it's also good. It's good in that there must be another provision, right? Our righteousness can't make us right with God. In fact, um, Isaiah would say this way, your righteousness is filthy rags. And so, I mean, if you think about it, it's like soiled linens. That's what he's saying about our righteousness. In fact, in fact Jesus spoke a parable, Luke 18, verse 9. This is kind of cool. But Luke, Luke, uh, Jesus spoke this parable, and it says, also he spoke this parable. Now look at who he speaks to. To those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Time out. Oh, this is so good. Um, because if I live um, legalistically, meaning my good works is what earns me my place with God, that my good works is what earns God's favor in my life. So if I, so that's legalistic, right? That's legalism. It's rule keeping, rule following. Now, if you're sitting there like, oh my God, is he saying we don't have rules? Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that God's hand on your heart, meaning the Holy Spirit inside of you, he said, I, I'm, I'm going to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God's hand on my heart, him riding on my heart is more powerful than him riding writing on clay tablets. And so this is the whole thing about the new covenant is that, that now it's not about rule keeping. It's about spirit following. It's not about how I keep the rules about following the Holy spirit and the Holy spirit knows all the rules. Right. And so, so I'm not doing away with doing righteous things. What I'm trying to make sure that we understand is that we're not right with God because of the right things that we do. OK, and so Jesus is talking and here's the thing. It, it says this. He was talking to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. And I just want to say when you live legalistically, when you live believing your performance is tied to your position. All right. When I live, believe my performance is tied to my position. That's legalism. And here's the problem. When I have to earn my relationship with God, I will make other people earn their relationship with me. Because I want everybody to play by the same rules, right? I want everybody to play by the same rules. And if I have to earn my place with God, you've got to earn your place with God. And if I have to earn my place with God, you've got to earn your place with me. And it says, this is why I said, and they despised others because they thought they were right with God because of what they did. But then Jesus tells this parable, and it was one of those like in your face kind of parables for, um, uh, for a Pharisee because he contrasts a Pharisee who they thought were righteous because of the things that he did. And he contrasts him with a tax collector, which was basically Satan's twin brother. Right? Because it was, remember, they were like sinners and then tax collectors. Like tax collectors had to get saved in order to be sinners. Like, because they were beyond, that's why it breaks them apart so many times in your Bible. It was like there, there are sinners and then there are tax collectors because to them, the tax collectors were the ones that had turned their back on the Jews because they were now uh, um, taking a position with Rome and they were enforcing the taxes of Rome upon God's people. And so to them, they had sold out for the whole route. Like there was no redemption for a tax collector, which may have been freaky when Jesus added some tax collectors to us. Aren't you glad that you are never too far gone for Jesus? Like, th aren't you thankful for the grace of God that, that even tax collector, he's like, oh, you're a tax collector and everybody else has counted you out. I'll count you in to be one of my apostles, one of my disciples, that, that your performance doesn't disqualify you. Your past performance doesn't disqualify you from what? God wants, can, and will do in your life. That's good news. And so, so anyways, he, he contrasts these two and, and the Pharisee is doing what a Pharisee does. He's standing in the church with his eyes towards heaven. He's saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other sinner. 
And I thank you, God, that I tithe and even beyond tithing, I give. I'm giving to the building. I'm giving to Arise, God. I thank you, God, today that, that I'm a life group leader. And I thank you, God, today that I have a morning devotion every day where I pray for three hours and then post the scriptures on Instagram so that everybody knows what I've received from you. God, I thank you today that I have never tasted alcohol. And I thank you today that I don't cuss when people cut me off in traffic. And I thank you, God, today. And he was just going on and on. And then, and then the tax collector's over there. And he's beating his chest and he won't even look to heaven. He's like, like, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that guy right there, that's the one that's right with God. Like, this would have ticked off every Pharisee. Like, what are you, he's a tax collector. But he's making the point in that you can't trust your righteousness. That your righteousness doesn't make you right with God. Paul said it this way in Romans 3, there is none righteous and then I think Paul was wondered that I think Paul was worried that that religious people might read this. So he reiterated, there is none righteous. No, not one. Like, I want to be real clear. How many righteous are there? None. No, not one. But no. I think that's why they always say, but no, not not one. I think he just wanted to be clear. So there is our righteousness. And then there's God's righteousness. And, and Paul is so qualified to talk about this because um, in, in, Gal in Galatians, I'm sorry, yes, no, in Philippians, in Philippians chapter three, in Philippians chapter three, that's where Paul, he's like, hey, if anyone could boast in their flesh, if anyone could boast in, in what they do, if anyone could boast in their own religious prowess, he's like, look, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the, on the, on the eighth day. Um, according, I was a Pharisee and I was zealous. And according to the law, I was blameless. This is what he was saying. Like, here's his, he's like, let me give you my religious resume. Like, have you ever met those people? <laughs> Hopefully they're not in your living room. But, um, <laughs> but they need to give you their religious resume so you know how good they are. And it's almost like if we had a choir today, we'd be singing not how great God is, but oh, how great you are. You know? um, and so Paul gives us his religious resume. And then he said this. He said, the things that I thought were gain, in other words, my own righteousness, my own righteous deeds, I thought that was what it was all about. But he said, I now count those things as, I like the old King James, it says dung. Like, I don't know how you get worse than that. <laughs> you know, some versions will say garbage, but it's dung. Yeah. Like, it stinks. And he's saying, I now count that as dung because I want to know God. Here, here's the truth. You can't know God. Listen, the law keeps you at a distance. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came. Yeah. And you can't know God through the law. You can know his standard, but you can't know him. But you can know God through grace. Because through grace, he qualifies us by what Jesus did, and he can make his home in us and speak to it. So we can't, if we want to live under the law, we'll never know God. We'll know his standard, and his standard doesn't change. I agree. And we'll know how to keep his standard. But if you really want to know God, then you got to trust, you got to trust in him and not in you. You got to trust, you, you got to have grace. And so he said, what things I thought were gained, I now count as lost for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And, and then he goes on to say, and having been found in him, this is verse nine, Philippians three, having been found in him, look at this, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So here he's saying, not my righteousness, but a righteousness that comes from God. So, so here's what you have to understand. Now he's talking about God's righteousness versus his, which is the conversation we're having. God's righteousness, our righteousness. And, and he's saying, my righteousness won't cut it. I need a righteousness that comes from God. Um, you know, the truth of it is the law was given to measure our righteousness. And it was given to show us that we can't be righteous. That's why Paul said, by the works, or, or by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul says that, uh, that every mouth would be stopped and we would all be made guilty. That was another reason the law was given, that the law was actually a school teacher to bring us to Christ. And so the law measures righteousness. And the law measures our righteousness, and, all, and, and we always come up short. Think about the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus, what do I got to do to follow you? And Jesus says, you know what? Here's what you got to do. Uh, you you got to go honor your father and mother, and, and he gives him all these things. And he says, I, those are all commands. I've done those things. And then Jesus said this, because the law will always find the one place you stumble. 
Because its goal is to make you realize you can't be right with God based on you. And so he says, oh, well, then this is what you need to do. Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor. And the rich young ruler said, I can't do that. I got a lot of money. Like, like I was doing okay with not lying and honoring mom and dad, but you're talking about emptying my bank account. I can't do that. Because that's what the law does. It measures our righteousness until it finds the place where we stumble. Right? It finds the place where we stumble. Why? Because the law was given to bring us to Christ to show us that I can't be righteous in myself, that I need God's righteousness because my righteousness is, is filthy rags. Here's a bad thing about legalism is it focuses on me. It's the narcissistic gospel. It is. It's the gospel of narcissism because under legalism, I look at my performance and my prayer life and the things that I do and the amount that I give and, and, and the group that I lead and the way that I serve and, and then the things that I don't do that everybody else does. And, and so all, the, all the, the law does, see, the law was supposed to make us look at ourselves to find out just like the rich young ruler that, that we fell short. But when we live legalistically, we live narcissistically. And what grace says is, I don't want you to focus on you. I don't want you to focus on your performance. I don't want you to look at your good deeds and your bad deeds. What grace says is, I don't want you to fo focus on you at all. I want you to focus on Jesus. Looking unto him, the author and the completer of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Look to Jesus. Like, focus on Jesus. Focus on his goodness and not your goodness. <laughs> His goodness is unfailing, unwavering, like his goodness is constant and consistent, like focus on Jesus. And so the law measures righteousness. Now, here's the great thing, because when we're talking about our righteousness, the law measures our righteousness and we come up short. But I don't know if you ever thought about it. The law measured Jesus' righteousness. Right. What did God say? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. God said he's perfect. I don't know if you thought about this, but the law, you could say God measured his righteousness. You could also say the world. Pilate, he stood before Pilate and Pilate said, I find no fault. Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? The law measures our righteousness and we always come up short. And the law measures Jesus' righteousness and he always exceeds the righteousness of the law. He never comes up short. And that's why we trust in his righteousness and not our righteousness, because he is the spotless lamb without sin. He, he's the lamb and the priest, right? He is the lamb that, that redeems us, and, and he is the lamb that purchases our salvation, and he is the priest that ministers to us. That, that was in always, in, in every way, tempted just like us, yet without sin. He's our lamb and he's our priest. Romans 10, I love the way it says this in the New Living Translation. Romans 10, verse 3, it says, For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the, the rules or the law, Right? So there's their righteousness. But Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. And as a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Isn't that? That's amazing. That's amazing. We can cling to our righteousness or we can believe in him. Now, listen, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can't be made right with God by what you do. You have to be made right with God by what Jesus did. You have to accept that. But in order to, to hold on to grace, you got to let go of the law. Yeah. In other words, let me say it this way, because some of you are like, oh, no, we can't let go of God's standard. Trust me, the Holy Spirit will remind you of God's standard. But, but, but here's what I'm saying. you got to let go of your righteousness if you want to accept his. Yeah, you got to lay it down that I'm not made. My performance and my position are not tied together. My position is tied to Jesus' performance. You have to lay down your righteousness to accept his righteousness. Let's talk about that second point. We can receive righteousness because of Jesus. Right? So, so we're, we, we have, we can be righteous because of Jesus. But now, put another word, we can receive righteousness because of Jesus. Uh, verse 3, Romans 4, what does Scripture say? If Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So Abraham did not earn righteousness, 
right? He, he believed God. Now, here's how we know this, because think about Abraham, before he was known as Abraham, was known as Abram, so, right? Um, and, and Abram was from Ur of the Chaldeans, and so it wasn't like God, let me say it this way, God didn't find Abraham in a worship service. It wasn't a prayer meeting. Like it wasn't like at church where God spoke to him because sometimes we come to church and we get a word from God about something God's going to do. Abraham wasn't at presbytery, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like he was at church worshiping and God came up and said, Abram, I want you to leave this land and go to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. Yeah. No, no, uh, Abram worshiped idols. In fact, he, he was from the Chaldeans, so they would have worshiped the moon god. And they actually believed that, that the, the, the moon controlled the heavens and the cycle of earth. And so that was his religion. So, so Abraham had probably just come from a good moon god worshiping time. <laughs> what, what, I, what I thought about this is not only was he an idolater, but he was worshiping the moon under a false pretense. He should have been worshiping the sun. Right, because the sun that controls the seasons, not the moon. Right, and so, anyways, so even in his false worship, he was wrong. And so it wasn't like Abraham had gotten anything right. That's my point. Right, and maybe you think I've got nothing right. Great, you're a candidate just like Abraham for the grace of Jesus. Right, he had got nothing right, and God comes to him. He didn't find God. He didn't know where to look. He was worshiping the moon. God comes to him. And why did God come to him? Think about this. God didn't come to him and say, Abram, if you'll stop doing all this bad stuff and start doing all this good stuff, then I can bless you. No, he didn't give Abraham the law. That's why he said, what did he gain by the works of flesh? The law is not going to be given for 700 years. Abraham didn't have a Ten Commandments. Moses is a long time later. <laughs> No, he came to Abraham, or he came to Abraham and he said, I want to bless you. My grace, I want to bless you. And I just need you to believe that. Can, can you believe today that God wants to bless you? Even if you've done nothing right so far? Because that's what Abraham, that's where he went. Nothing right so far, God comes to him, I want to bless you. Can you believe God wants to bless you even if you got nothing right, right? And so Abraham didn't earn it. In fact, Romans 4, verse 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but is due. And then verse 5 says, And to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Look at it. To the, to the one who works, it's not counted as a gift. So he's saying this. He's saying righteousness is a gift, and we know that, right? We know uh, Romans 5, 17 says, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life, right, through Jesus Christ. So the gift, so we know righteousness is not a goal we achieve, but a gift we receive. We, we understand that. But think about this. The one whose wages are not counted, uh, if he, in other words, if he earns it, it's not a gift. Like, for instance, if, if this next Friday your boss came to you and let's say you've been working hard all week, you've been coming in, let's say early, you've been coming in early, been staying late, not really taking your full lunch break. I mean, you are just, you are working hard. And then this, this Friday your boss comes in with your paycheck and he says, hey, I want to give you a gift. You would be sitting there like, gift nothing. Like, I, I worked 50 hours this week. This is not a gift. I earned it, yeah, yeah. right? Come on, come on. It's not a gift. And here's what he's saying is with, with, with Abraham, he didn't earn it. It is a gift. And I can't think of, of a more, um, like, incredibly dishonoring thing except to receive a gift of righteousness and then act like we earned it. I mean, think about this. Let's do another scenario. Let's just say somebody you don't really know or somebody you do know. They just come up to you and say, hey, you didn't do anything. You didn't earn this. But here's a check for $5,000. And then you turn around and say, well, I knew I deserved it because I've been doing some good stuff. And obviously, you must have heard about the good stuff I was doing. No, no, it's either works or it's a gift and we either earn it or we don't. And how disrespectful, how dishonoring. I mean, I can't even fathom. That's when I run out of words. I just make sounds. 
<laughs> Somebody at home said, oh, he's speaking in tongues. Let me interpret. Listen, the Lord. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was raised in Pentecostal church. Forgive me. Anyways, um, <laughs> four people just logged off. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but, but, but how, how dishonoring to the blood of Jesus would it be? In fact, Paul said, if we think we earn it, Jesus died in vain. How dishonoring God's trying to give us a gift, right? Well, I'm, I'm glad you heard about me. I've been doing a lot of good, right? No, it's, it's, it's a gift. And, and listen, you can't earn it. It's, it's free. You don't obtain it. It comes from God. Um, and and here's, here's, here's how it comes. It says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted or counted, depending on your version. So in the Bible, there's a, there's a, a Greek word, logizomai. And, and so if it's reconciled, counted, accounted, um, th- those words, imputed, um, those words are typically logizomai. And logizomai literally means to take out of an account and to put into account. That's why it's reconciled. It means to balance something, if you will, to reconcile, to take out, to put into an account. And I want you to think about this. So how, how are we made righteous apart from our works? Well, think about this. How did Jesus, how was he made sin apart from his works? Because we all have to believe that Jesus was without sin. Otherwise, he's not a fitting sacrifice. Right? He had to be the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. Right? And so... How, how, if he never sinned, how did he become sin? Look at what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And says this, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So think about this. If Jesus never sinned, how did he become sin? It's this word, logizomai. Because David said, blessed are those who are, who are not, whose sins are not imputed to them, meaning they're not given credit. It's, it's not put in their account. And so, so this word, what it means is that he didn't have sin, but God put sin in his account. He imputed sin to him. He knew no sin, but he became sin. How? God, Logizamai, he put sin in his account. And whose sin did he put in his account? The sin of the whole world. Let me help you this. Not only all the sin you have committed, but all the sin that will ever be committed. Right? Because he's not going to die again tomorrow if you mess up. So all the sin, one side, Hebrews said, one sacrifice for all sin for all time. He put all sin in G- Logizimah, put all sin in his account. Now, why did he do that? Because once he had done that, wrath could come upon Jesus Judgment, condemnation could come upon Jesus. Uh, Whose who's judgment? Ours. Who, who, the wrath that who earned? That we earned. So he became the magnet for the condemnation, for the judgment, for the wrath of God to fall on him. That's why we assumed him smitten, rejected by God because the wrath of God, right, came upon him. Why? Because God, he deposited, he he, he put all the world's sin in his account. Why did he do that? So he could put all of Jesus' righteousness in our account. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we would become the righteousness of God. It's imputed to us. It's, it's deposited in our account because we believe, not because we earn it. Right? That we, we, um, we receive this righteousness as a gift. When we believe in Jesus, we receive his righteousness. Here's the third thing. The third thing is that we remain righteous because of Jesus. We remain righteous because of Jesus. Um, it says Abraham believed God and he was made righteous because he believed. We believe God and we're made righteous because we believe. We just read it, Romans 5, 4, verse 5, and to the one who does not work but believes, doesn't work, that's our righteousness, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, right? Um, his faith is Logizma, accounted to him as righteousness. Right, that's righteousness. So Abraham was made righteous because we believe. Now we cover that. So Abraham's out here worshiping the moon god. I don't know how you worship the moon god. Or is it hum diggity hum diggity hum diggity? I don't know. I don't know how that is. 
But he's out there and he's worshiping the moon god. Oh, great moon god. <laughs> so grateful for summer, you know, whatever. I don't know what he was saying to the moon. I don't know what you say to a moon god since there is no moon god. But anyways, he's out there worshiping. And God comes to him and says, I want to bless you. Can you believe it? And God comes to us and he says, I want to bless you and you can believe it. Now, we don't have a problem with Abraham being made right with God because he was completely lost and then he was made right with God. But how did Abraham stay right with God? Because you know what I think is interesting about the Bible? And I love the Bible. <clears throat> but the Bible doesn't record Abraham's sins before he came to God. But we have a list of sins after he came to God. Right? Because it was, it was after he came to God that he lied, not once, but twice, and said, she's not my wife, <laughs> she's my sister. And was willing for a king to take her into his harem and sleep with her. It's in your Bible. It's like she was married, but still got to be on The Bachelor. And he's like, I don't want them to kill me. I hope you get the rose. <laughs> and then, because that's not enough. And then he slept with his maid. And had a baby. He became a baby daddy. And it wasn't the woman he was married to. Like, I don't know what he did before. I know what he did after. Of course, then I think if this is what he did after he came to God, what did he do before? <laughs> and was he in the mafia? I don't know. <laughs> but here's the point is be before he had known God, we don't have a problem saying, well, he believed in his counting him to righteousness. And that's how that's how he was made right with God. But how did he stay right with God? Because did it change after? I mean, after, after he made all those mistakes and lied and put his wife on The Bachelor, and how did he stay right with God? Because the righteousness that comes by faith, remember, is based on God and not us. And God never changes. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um. Look at this, Romans 6, verse 17. I love this because Paul kind of gives a picture here. He says, but thanks be to God, because you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which, of, to which you were committed. In other words, you, you understand the gospel of grace, right? That's what he's talking about. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you have become, look at this, slaves of righteousness. Did you read that? So, so, so get, let me give you the picture that he's given them. You were in a prison camp um, of sin. And you were held in that prison camp by the law. The strength of sin is the law. That's why preaching on the law doesn't help people. It just causes them to sin. I said this the other day. I said, growing up, I went to every youth thing because, you know, we wanted to go, had to go once they were friends. And they all were trying to convince us that we we're going to hell is the way it felt to me. And, um, and so we would go and they would say, here are the things you can't do. You can't drink. You can't do drugs. You can't have sex and you can't listen to rock and roll. Well, guess what four things we all wanted to do? <laughs> like if we hadn't thought about it before. Right. It made us want to think about, well, if that's if that's so bad, why is it so good? You know, it's like I don't I don't know about that. You know, but you, know, you can't drink, you can't do drugs, you can't can't have sex and you can't listen to rock and roll music. So that's it's, why, because strength of sin is law. I had a friend one time, this is a crazy story, but he had like a, a, an old washing machine. It still worked. He'd taken it out, gotten a new one. And so he put it out on his curb. He thought, well, before I have it hauled away, I'll just put it out there. Maybe somebody else could use it. It still technically works. So he put his washing machine out there and it said, with a big sign that said free. Went all day, no one even asked about it. So just because, and I think he's a counselor now, just because he's a counselor, uh, he, he changed it. He put a big sign out there that said uh, $50. Someone stole it. <laughs> no lie. True story. 
Why? Because the strength of sin is the law. When it was free, it's like, I don't need, wait, it's worth 50 bucks. I'm going to steal that tonight. <laughs> Why? And so here's what Paul is saying. We, we were held in this prison camp of sin. We were held in the prison camp of sin. But he's saying, but then we believed in Jesus. And Colossians says we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So we were translated out of the prison camp of sin into the prison camp of righteousness. Now think about that. Just as the law holds us in the prison camp of sin. You ready for this? Grace holds us in righteousness. Because righteousness is the state of being right with God. NES is the suffix meaning state of being, state of being righteous. So it's a state of being. In fact, most of the time when Paul's talking about sin, sin in the book of Romans is, is, there for, is translated into sin 48 times. 46 of those times, it is a noun, not a verb. It is not behavior. It's a state of being. It's a place. It's, it's where we were. And so he's saying, you were held in sin by the law, but thanks be to God who through Christ Jesus, right, has freed us from the law of sin and death. And so we were held in, in sin by the law. But now he says, now we've been enslaved by righteousness. Now we're held in righteousness by the grace of Jesus. I'm not held in righteousness by my performance. I'm held in righteousness righteousness by what Jesus did. I'm not here because I was good enough. I'm here because he was more than good enough. I'm not here because I got it all right. I'm here because he got it. And tomorrow, if I mess up like Abraham and I'm putting my wife on the bachelor or, or acting a fool, I'm still held in righteousness by the grace of God as long as I'm believing in him and not myself. Are you with me? I've been translated into this place of righteousness held by grace and it's not based on my work so that I don't have bragging rights it's based on what Jesus did it's his bragging rights my performance is no longer tied to my position my position is not tied to my performance my position is tied to the performance of Jesus alone nothing else it is tied to him he has all the bragging rights. Not me. This is why we worship him. We come in and say, you are worthy to be praised. Why? Because you did it all. You paid it all. It's because of you that we can have it all. Are you with me? You have the bragging rights. And now I am held in righteousness by the grace of Jesus. Jesus provided the righteousness. Jesus made it a gift. He, he is giving righteousness, right? But listen, Jesus sustains us in righteousness. The same grace that saves us is the same grace that sustains us. Listen to me. Before you come to God, your righteousness, what you do is filthy rags. Let me hope you something. After you come to God, your righteousness, still filthy rags. Yeah, yeah. Come on. His righteousness is what's needed to save you. Yeah, yeah. And it's his righteousness that is what sustains your relationship with God. And this is so good because today, if you're like Abraham and you receive Christ by faith, but you've made mistakes, listen, it didn't cost you your place with God. Now, we still need to come to God. We need to ask for forgiveness, but that's more about cleansing our conscience than it is changing our location. My relationship with God is secured in Jesus because of what he did. And so whether I'm good, whether I'm bad, whether I'm bad and that's good, whether I'm good and that's bad, my place is held by Jesus. My position is held by Jesus. That's why he has the bragging rights. And I don't. He has the bragging rights. It's him and nothing else. Amen. Amen. Why don't you, you can stand. If you're in the room, you can stand. If you're at home or you can stay seated. Hey, Pastor Marty Stray here from Pathway Church. I am so honored that you tuned in today, and I pray that your life has been empowered and impacted 
um, and transformed by the Word of God. I want to encourage you right now to click subscribe so that you never miss one of these videos, one of these messages, whether that's on the podcast, you can subscribe there, or even on YouTube. You can subscribe there and click the bell for notifications and you'll never miss any of our content. Also down in the comments below on YouTube, there are other ways to connect with us like social media and we would love to hear from you. We would love to connect with you. I also want to encourage you to join us uh, live online uh, every Sunday, 9, 11, and 4 uh, at mypathway.church forward slash live or of course you can find us on Facebook. We would love to have you with us. Thank you so much for tuning in today.